Hello and welcome to the Trauma Resonance Resilience podcast and it's so good to be back. I haven't been online with you for quite a while so I'm really pleased to be here and I'm really excited because I'm always excited. I always start off my podcast with I'm really excited to be talking to somebody today that I just know you're going to love listening to. So let me introduce you. I'm going to be speaking to Craig Pinkney. He's a criminologist an urban youth specialist and director at Solve. He's currently a PhD researcher, which I might have to talk to you about because I'm about to embark yes. on that journey as well. Masters in criminology. Uh, he's based at Birmingham. Uh, he's got over 16 years of experience as an outreach worker, transformational speaker, international gang exit strategist, mediator, mentor, filmmaker, well known for working in some of the country's most challenging areas and with those young people, high risk offenders, victims of gang violence who are deemed most hard to reach. Also the UK lead for the EU Gangs Project and advisor for the Ministry of Justice in Jamaica. I can't go on anymore. <laughs> Please welcome Craig Pinkney. Hello. Morning, morning, morning. And thank you for having me on your podcast. You really just woke me up today. So I feel like I need to make sure I bring my A game for you to start the, the weekend off. That is what we need. We need a little bit of the A game today. Um, we're recording this on a Friday morning um, at, at a very tumultuous time. So we, we need as much kind of help as we can get right now, don't we? Yeah. So I'm going to, I'm just going to go straight, mm. straight in really. Um, one of your kind of taglines is bridging the gap between academia and the streets. What do you mean when you say that? I think in the most simplistic way is, you know, with all the books and knowledge and theories and approaches that, you know, us geeks in universities oftentimes talk about, one of the things that I'm very um, passionate about is ensuring that members of the community and those that are supposed to receive research um, and new approaches are able to kind of get it in a way that is easy to adapt. So I know that, for example, working with, you know, youth workers, they may not read, you know, uh, five big massive books about this thick um, over a couple of weeks when they want to engage. So I always kind of create um, kind of scenarios or training opportunities to give them all of the kind of up-to-date contemporary models that they can use in real time. Um, and I think that's really important. And I think why? Because as a uh, as a practitioner and now becoming an academic, one of the things that I've always found is that academics sometimes sit what I call in the ivory tower and, you know, they can write all of the research and write all of these brilliant articles and they want the community to read it. But then sometimes the community have to pay 50 pounds or 60 pounds to read a document that might be life and death for them. So what, one of the things that I try to do with my understanding of um, research and contemporary um, ideas around the issues that we face in society is about how can I create that in a way in that those from the community that are ultimately um, the kind of bearers of light and the, the, the game changers around ensuring change in our community, how can they get that information in the most quickest and simplistic form that they can actually um, put out in real time? So that's what I call bridging the gap between academia and the streets. Yeah, and I love that. And you're absolutely right. There's something about that whole uh accessibility to research not just that you have to pay to access documents but actually some stuff is written so academically that it's inaccessible in terms of understanding it i mean i don't know about you but i've read articles that you know really should have taken me a, a very short amount of time if it was about word count but trying to understand them mm -hmm. um and and having that knowledge that it's not it's not you, it's actually the document. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other thing I was thinking about when you were talking was around um, language. Um, and I guess one of the challenges is around language is that the young people you're working with have a language, mm -hmm. services have a language, and often those two are very different things. So it makes accessing those spaces really difficult? 
Most definitely. And I think one of the things that, um, again, which kind of leads to the, the, the strap line that we're talking about is kind of this idea about staying in real time. So when I talk about my work, even if I just use youth work as an example, I talk about unrolled youth work. And then that kind of philosophy around unrolled youth work that I talk about is standing on the shoulders of traditional models that work. So it's not saying eradicate things from the past. What it is, is what it is saying and what it's pushing professionals to is getting them to understand what is the context of where we are in terms of 2020 and beyond. And what, uh, what is the language, you know, what is the, the cultural expressions of different people? Because then it, 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 it doesn't require that the professional or practitioner that's working with young people, for example, it doesn't make them stay stagnant. It makes you continuously learn. And as a youth work practitioner working within my local community, it's important that I understand language. It's important that I stay relevant because it's those things that's going to enable me to bridge that gap between a young person that may be in need versus a young person that may have a series of needs and they don't get met by wider society. So we as adults within a society that are supposed to be supporting children, young people and their families, it is important that we're up to speed and up to date. And we can't have this mindset of, well, I trained 15 years ago and the information that I got 15 years ago is, is adequate. When we're talking about social media, we're talking about the impact of social media, we're talking about new forms of exploitation, new forms of extremism and all of these different things are happening in this technological space i think that it's not enough for us as workers practitioners or researchers to sit and say well i don't understand it um i think it's important that we do understand it and i think that's the reason why i always talk about it in my work it's not just about having passion or it's not just about having passion but also having intellect and it's about merging that to the two so having the passion of wanting to do something and wanting to create change, but are you clear about what the agenda is? Do you have knowledge of your community? Do you have knowledge of the things that you're doing? Do you have knowledge of the historical context in terms of where people are? And do you have knowledge of the interventions that have worked versus the interventions that don't work? Because what we always do is kind of do things thinking it's the good thing and the nice thing to do, but actually it's the total opposite in terms of an outcome that we deem to be effective. You're bang on, absolutely spot on. And it's a little bit like um, when I, you know, when I'm talking, <laughs> I just think for me, having a basic understanding in the sectors that I work in of trauma, attachment um, and adversity uh, and some basic neuroscience should be a baseline and it, and it isn't yet that stuff isn't a baseline yet. Um, and thinking about um, the realities of living with social media 24 hours a day is something that people over a certain age have not experienced. Yes. And that isn't acknowledged properly as well. Um, and I'm wondering how, I mean, it's fantastic to listen to you speak so passionately about that, but I'm wondering how, how that becomes integrated in a way of being through early vocational training programs that ensure that people going into those places of work understand that this is a continuum. This is something that we continually have to be reflecting on, addressing, thinking about, talking about, being curious about, you know, what are the options for making sure that people understand that? And I think one of the things that, you know, I'll just use an example, you know, when I used to lecture at UCB in Birmingham for seven years, one of the things that was always important that every time we would have our team meetings every, either every semester or every year, we would always talk about the things that are ultimately relevant. So every module that a student enters into, there has to be an element of what is contemporary within society. So for example, if I was working at the university right now, there would have to be modules that look at the issue of racism and anti-racist practice. Why? Because it's contemporary. So that continuum that you're talking about is almost in line in terms of what's happening in real time. There is no point teaching, training professionals that are going to be working in the field over the next 10, 15, 20 years, information that's ultimately not going to be impactful and make them an effective worker. 
we're actually doing a disservice to students and to learning professionals if we don't give them that type of information. And I think that's the reason why as, a, as an organization, we invest so much into training and developing practitioners um, and developing them in a way in which is kind of bespoke that extra skill set and knowledge that they may have with their foundation um, principles and training that they ultimately have. So whether it's social workers that we're working with or whether it's solicitors that we're working with, both entities may do two completely different things, but there's skills and there's things that they can acknowledge, things like emotional intelligence, things like body language, you know, getting them to understand things like trauma, because all of these things, whether physiologically or biologically, can be playing out right in front of you, but you may not necessarily be aware. And you may be looking at, for example, a child or a young person and thinking that they're being disobedient or being rude, when in fact they may be absolutely petrified. So it's getting people to kind of recognize the different things that you may see um, that young people may kind of deposit in terms of their behaviors and how do you react in real time? And just like when we talk about the dangers that are out there, when we talk about that continuum of social media and technology and music and all of these things are changing that are seen to be having an impact on youth cultures, how do we respond as adults? And it's the same thing that I would say to parents as well that you included, it's not just about, you know, professionals having that understanding, but it's also about parents understanding what it is that your children are doing. Like I know with, with my children, for example, I question my children about what they're playing, who they're talking to online, what is the understanding of the game. So they have those conversations that it's not just black and white, that they're playing a game and not being able to comprehend what's ultimately taking place. Yeah. And I mean, <sighs> Absolutely. And I was thinking about thinking about anti-racist practice while you were talking and in, in the 90s, and I think I've said this a few times, in the 90s, we talked about anti-racist practice, you know, as part of social work practice. There were all sorts of things that we talked about and tried to integrate and made explicit. And then something happened and we stopped talking about anti-racist practice. Yeah. And I don't know what, what shifted because actually there were enough inquiries in the social work arena that should have kept it very much at the forefront, but something shifted. And we've come back to talking about some of those things that we started yeah. to unpick in the 90s. What's your take on that? I think one of the things that is really important is kind of, and a good thing about literature, it kind of gives us a historical journey. So you're totally um, correct and bang on in the sense that in the 90s, there was that talk about um, racism and anti-racist practice because you've also got bearing in the 90s, there was a lot of things that were happening across Great Britain and across the Western Hemisphere as a whole as it related to issues around racism. I would say that was on the back of the stuff that was happening in the 70s and 80s that brought us to that point of the 90s where there was actually conversations about that. I would say going into the early 2000s, what started to happen was there was an integration of all forms of discrimination. And then what happened was, is if you notice that the literature, and I remember going back to university when I did my first ever degree, all of the books that we were reading in the library was about anti-oppressive practice. So it was yes. talking about all forms of discrimination. So race was a part of it, disability, sexuality, um, um, there was different forms of discrimination that was spoke about in the context of discrimination. Now, what happens is, and what happened is, all forms of discrimination were discussed. So you had those that were kind of key stakeholders in, uh, in rights around sexuality, those that were fighting against individuals um, and their rights in terms of disability, gender, for example. So it's almost like in a very weird way, there was kind of like a pecking order. I, I'm using the, the term pecking order in the looser terms. So you notice that gender sexuality kind of became the forefront of people talking and challenging and talking about anti-oppressive practice as it relates to issues around gender, issues around sexuality. But race always ends up at the bottom. So even though people are saying anti-racist, sorry, anti-oppressive practice, what they're talking about is sexuality, disability, gender, issues as opposed to talking about race so what i have acknowledged is that the, the conversation about racism is an uncomfortable one 
and people don't know what to do and people don't know how to have the conversation. So using a wider term discrimination or anti-oppressive practice, it's almost like in a very weird way, a scapegoat to not deal with the, the issue. So now when we talk about two, 2020, where we're having now a conversation about one in the pandemic, the issue of George Floyd has kind of heightened everybody's attention to this issue around systemic racism, police brutality, state violence. Now we're having a conversation again. Now, one of the things that's really important, I think even for myself moving forward, and it's, a, it's something that I have conversations with, with um, organizations and councils that I advise, is that we make it very clear that we have to look at things in a very weird way in silos sometimes. So I remember having a conversation with a colleague not too long ago, and I was talking about developing training around racism and anti-racist practice. And a number of colleagues had said in the meeting, oh yeah, but we should also talk about other forms of discrimination. And I said, no, because the danger of that is we talk about other forms of discrimination, which is, which is right, but then the, the pecking order starts again by default because we may want to talk about sexuality or gender, and we fight so much for, for those causes, which is brilliant, but then we ignore the issue around race. So in this particular scenario, I argue that it has to solely be about race and anti-racist training. And I think that that conversation is now coming back um, into whether that is debate, whether that is within just kind of society as a whole about what does anti-racist training ultimately look like. And let's kind of pull the wool over people's eyes about this idea about feeling uncomfortable because when people feel uncomfortable the easiest thing to do is just write it off yeah um and i think one of the challenges is because yes it's uncomfortable but it's actually also very complex yeah. it's very embedded and i was um reading isabel wilkerson's book cast and she talks about how integrated it is within us like grammar it's such an unspoken language it's such an unspoken experience that it's like grammar i thought that was really clever you know that the way that grammar frames a word is an unspoken language about what that sentence means and and it's that level of nuance i think that is what makes this uncomfortable and of course, it was wonderful watching, oh, what was it called? Little Fires? Little Fires are everywhere. What was it called? Come on, you must have seen it. It was fantastic. It was on um, Netflix or Prime. Oh, I can't remember. Anyway, yeah, it was... Tell me now so I can look it up. I will, I will find it for you. It was well worth the watch because it really unpicked um, the, the niceness and the danger of the niceness, um, the we're not, we're not racist, we're the good people, we do the good things. Yeah. And, it's, and it really started to nuance that conversation. And I think that's what's really difficult because it's so embedded and so ingrained that getting past there is a real challenge so when you're going into environments where do you begin to help people start that really difficult uncomfortable journey i think it's a uh, it's a process um and when i talk um about the process when you look at for example if we talk about the the black lives matter campaigns and the global um kind of outcry um fighting against the system of racism I say that process starts one potentially with civil unrest and protesting because you're going to have individuals that essentially are not happy. And these are the things that we're ultimately seeing within the wider society, you know, people going out and all groups of people were ultimately going out. And if you look at kind of protests in a kind of historical context, the protest has always kind of remained the same, that the, the outcry is kind of the awakening for wider society to say we need to do something about this particular issue. But the second stage I believe is the most important and this is where individuals like myself come in because then you're gonna have individuals that are articulate, intelligent, um, that are able to 
talk to individuals in positions positions of power and authority about the demands in which what people want as opposed to asking but demanding and i think that's the difference so when i kind of look at the kind of the uh, conversations about um people protesting it's interesting i had a conversation yesterday and someone had said to me, oh, you know, didn't you think it was brilliant that, you know, all people from different groups and nations and backgrounds were out protesting? And I said, on surface, of course, it looked amazing. But the kind of cynic in me just kind of wonders how far that ultimately goes. Because what we're talking about is not just banners and, and posters talking about um, Black Lives Matter and stop police brutality. But what we're talking about is systematic change. So what I'm interested in is my white counterparts that pledge allegiance to not walk with me in the street, but are prepared to challenge the systems that be in their positions of power. That's what I'm interested in. So I'm not, I've never really been interested in tokenistic slogans, campaigns, you know, websites or organizations say we stand in line with the Black Lives Matter campaign, when there's a history of behaviors that exist within your organization that doesn't seem to change. So for me, that doesn't actually um, add up. So I would be more inspired and motivated by my white counterparts that support in that fight as opposed to just walking on the street. And this is not to kind of tell people that they shouldn't. And this is not to say, you know, and deter people away from having that mindset. But we're talking about anti-racist practice. And this is what anti-racist practice is. It is action. And that's why I always kind of remove myself away from this kind of unconscious bias type of training idea. And I understand the importance of unconscious bias because it's about self-reflection. It's around reflexivity. It's about understanding you as an individual and the, the kind of default position that you may have about individuals or groups that may have come from either lived experiences or things you've watched on the TV, or things you've watched on the news that have kind of created ideas about groups of people that sometimes you're not consciously aware of, but that's not what I am talking about. What I'm talking about is something that is embedded in terms of the fiber of all forms of human activity across the Western hemisphere, that by default, people are privileged within a society. And through that particular privilege, whether that is economic, whether that is by resources, whether that is based on the the kind of opportunities that people have within society, that's what people ultimately need to understand. So this is not kind of a, 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 an excuse that, or a banner that people are holding to say, I need you to feel sorry for me. Because what I say in my work is that we don't need black sympathy. You know, for my white counterparts, I don't need people crying. I don't need people holding my hand and saying, Craig, you know, this is all awful. What I want is for you to join the fight and joining the fight means that we need to come together and think about how we're going to dismantle the system that has been created to benefit one group of people over somebody else. And I think that is the understanding. And I think part of the understanding about anti-racism is our lack of understanding of racism. So we all talk about anti-racist practice, but when I ask the basic person, what do we mean by racism? What is the system of white supremacy? We hear these terminologies and we think, okay, these things, these words sound off, but what are the meanings and what is the kind of definitions around these terminologies that enable us to have a wider understanding of how this system impacts all of our lives in one way, shape or another? Do you think that that ability to be reflective, that thinking about unconscious bias, that having those reflections, do you think that that leads to people standing together and fighting anti, in an, for anti-racist practice? I mean, what you're suggesting to me is that forget all that, forget all that reflection, forget all that unconscious bias, but do you, do you not think and I'm very willing to be wrong about this, but do you not think that having the opportunity to understand where that comes from within yourself is what enables people to stand up and walk and walk the talk? Yes, and, and to an extent, yes, because there needs to be a space to reflect. What I'm challenging is that what a lot of white counterparts that I have fed, and I'm saying this from my friends and colleagues, 
that we stay in the reflective space for a very, very long time, where I'm the mm. one that's the victim. So it's almost like me working with a young woman that is, or someone in our community that is a victim of domestic violence. I can be very reflective and understanding of the fact that this is happening in the community. But what that woman wants is for me to help get that man past prosecuted or challenge that man because he's doing the wrong thing. And that's the only analogy I can kind of bring that will give understanding to what it is that I'm talking about. So when I say from a black perspective, what I don't want is just reflection. What I want is action because it's life and death for me. It's life and death for my family members. It's life and death for my children that haven't done nothing wrong, that are going to grow up in a society where people are going to hate them, mistreat them, give them lack of opportunities solely on the basis of the color of their skin, not their talents, not their intellect, not their grades, but solely on what they look like. And we live in a society that is so racialized that we as a society in a wider sense cannot see. So it's almost like when we talk about the idea of black trauma and these are other kind of terminologies that I hope that our listeners will look into, these conversations are very triggering because we're still having to explain the system of racism that happens every single day. And it's almost like, in a very weird way, it's like, can you not see it? Can you, can you not see it? Like, what other example do I need to give? What other video do you need to see on social media to say there's something that right here? Mm. And it's almost like there's, there's, there's a kind of a history of these t- particular types of behaviors that oftentimes go unlooked. And I think that is part of what the system is. The system's also designed that with that privilege, it also makes people cognitive dissonant. So when we talk about that reflective idea, that reflective notion around how do we remove from that space, it's also about not being cognitive dissonant no more, that you know it's there, but you just choose to ignore it. I don't unfortunately have the opportunity to ignore it because I'm the one that has to go out and face that. Because when I go out, they don't care that I've got five degrees because they don't see it, because I don't have a poster that says it. All they see is a a, a hyper-masculine black male that may fit the description of the stereotypes that's given to people every single day. And I experienced that at work. I've experienced that in some of the, the biggest spaces that I've had the opportunity for. And it's not necessarily things that people have done disrespectfully, but it's unconscious being in a university and someone saying, do you teach sport? Do you teach music? Are you a security guard? Now I've got a badge on just like everybody else in the lift. So why have all of these assumptions come out of nowhere? And some people say, well, you know, maybe, you know, you're over-exaggerated and this is one that you often hear all the time. Maybe you're over-exaggerating, but I say it's interesting that individuals that are like me in other institutions around the country say very similar stories so it can't be a coincidence it cannot be just kind of in my imagination so we know that these behaviors whether conscious or subconscious are in the fiber of cultures that exist within institutions and i think that until we kind of have that understanding and not just have the understanding but move forward to change those systems I just feel like we're going to be having the same conversation that we had in the 90s about understanding the system of racism. I'd like to think we've moved on. I mean, I really would. I'd like to think that 2020 opens up a very particular type of space for very different conversations. And, um, but, you know, I, I guess that there's a cynic in me there as well. And I was thinking about what you were saying about can people not see can people not see that this is happening? And I was thinking about, um, I was thinking about Donald Trump, actually, um, who's worth bringing into the space, albeit just for a moment, um, who has had 26 women come forward saying that he has sexually assaulted them. And nothing is done about that. You know, it's like that cannot be seen. There are things that people choose not to see and I'm quite interested I mean that again that's a privilege to spend some time pontificating about why is that that people can't see that and I recognize that but I was thinking about that as well while you were talking the things that people choose not to see and because he says it's not happening then it's not happening and I guess it's the same kind of thing and I was also thinking about the care experience 
and we'll get on to young people in a minute and um thinking about that experience of talking about the care experience and being met with professional pity mm -hmm. uh professionally and as a younger person and one of the things that i found really interesting exploring anti-racism and anti-racist practice and listening to yourself is some of the things that i found difficult to understand about that now make a lot more sense actually that there's a lot to be offered in understanding um in understanding different things as well and i guess you know people need to understand that as well that you know this is we can get very lost in you know whether something feels you know for us to go into you know but i i always think about that that care experience alongside that as well and different other things as well um i want to bring young people into into the space really just because i with your youth work background and thinking about some of the language that we use um with young people that um i don't know that feels quite contemporary but is actually quite old so we use um cse we use county lines we use gangs we you know we use stuff that makes it sound like it's a new thing um it also takes it out of the context of what's going on in wider society and i wondered if you could perhaps share a bit about what um what you're seeing what feels very contemporary what's going on out there what are young people saying you know what's happening I would say that most of the issues that we hear young people um, talk about is not new. You know, we've all of them, I think I'm agreeing with you, with all of these kind of new terminologies that are kind of thrown out there. And I kind of like something that you said earlier that we talk about language and there's almost like a complete divide. So you've got the language in which what young people use and the language in which what the state and systems ultimately use and services. And even when we talk about things like CSE or CCE, young people have always been exploited, you know, and you think if you look at like the stories of Oliver Twist, that was County Lines, you know, if you look at it in context, you know, that was CCE, but we use these terminologies to, to kind of fit whatever political agenda that's in the moment. And it's interesting that, you know, when we talk about the cuts within services, um, since 2010 and 2011, we've actually got videos and interviews with workers predicting that these things were going to happen. I mean, the word wasn't CC at that time, but we said that these things are going to start to happen when you start to slash youth and community services and services that engage with children also. So when, if, when we kind of talk about kind of the, 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 the fact that young people, children, have a lack of services and organizations be able to deal with the issues that young people are, are facing in today's society. And when I say issues, I'm talking about multiple issues. I'm talking about homelessness, mental health. I'm talking about drugs and alcohol, abuse, sexual violence, bullying, peer pressure, suicide, you know, gangs and all those other things are kind of just like the added things that we oftentimes hear more so than the things that I've just previously mentioned. Now we've got COVID-19 and the vulnerabilities of children and young people have risen. The only variable I would say that is very different in a kind of historical context to where we are now is technology. And the kind of use of technology and social media and the way in which human beings communicate has become so sophisticated that individuals that are involved in criminal behavior or seek to exploit children in a range of different ways can utilize social media and don't have to do it in a physical sense. So when we look at things like, for example, I don't know, sex offenders, you know, at one point in history, sex offenders had to physically go out and do things 
Whereas now they can go on the dark web. They don't even have to go on the dark web. They can use Instagram. They can use Snapchat. They can use email. They can use WhatsApp. They can use TikTok. They can use House Party. They can utilize all of these different platforms in order to engage children and young people without necessarily having to um, physically see them. And the same way in which drug dealers, extremists, terrorists of all forms utilize these particular platforms. So as a professional and as a worker, it makes my job 10 times harder because I can't go out and physically see where these human beings are because now I'm going to have to understand social media, which brings back to my, the previous conversation that we just had before talking about racism, because it's important now that professionals understand how to use these gadgets. How do we understand how young people communicate? So it's not necessarily having a PhD and understanding Snapchat and Instagram, but understanding the dynamics of, of how it works. I was dealing with a suicide um, on Monday and the, the only reason that we was able to save that young man is because he tried to do a, a Instagram live. Now, if we didn't understand what Instagram live was, and was able to see the young man um, being quite upset before he decided to start harming himself, there's a potential that we probably wouldn't have got to him in time if we were so clueless and oblivious to social media. And that's my point. So I would argue that the needs of children and young people and the vulnerabilities of young people have increased over the years and specifically within the last 10 to 11 year period because of slats, slashes and cuts to services and I think now the mindset is, oh, let's just reinstate youth and community services to young people, and it's going to cause a change. And what I would argue is that even if the youth centres open back up tomorrow, it would take us about 15 years to get us back to where we were to 2009, because we've got to deal with all of these other issues and the, the issues that are new in terms of the issues that young people are facing today. And I think that is why our challenge becomes even now harder. You're so right. And, and I think that that's so misunderstood. And um, the thing about social media is, you know, it's not only is it all the things you said it is, but it's also 24 hours a day. Yes. So there's all this stuff going on that people cannot see. And I think there is, um, there is a, a group of people who were not are not of the generation who really under you know had that all of their lives mm -hmm. and then there's people over a certain age that really don't have any kind of understanding about what all of those things look like and how exploitation happens i mean i think about the 80s and the ex particular exploitations and i was a young person i was a vulnerable young person in the 80s and i think about the things that happened and one one of the things when services got involved it was often for the first time there was a lack of knowledge about the impact of for example coming out of care and being homeless there was a lack of knowledge and understanding about that i don't think we can say there's a lack of knowledge anymore yes you, can't. you know we're not in that place we not know that they like this no Have a click of a button no, we're not in that place. So there, there's, I'm wondering then, is it something to do with, if I don't understand you, or I don't understand something, or I don't understand an issue, is it about, as an individual, as a collective, as a community, making the decision to walk onto that side of the street to go and find out? Is that what is not, happening i also believe that the way that our society is also designed it's also designed for us to be ignorant and remain ignorant and those that are i don't want to use the word easily led but i guess individuals that are not i guess Okay, let me just use a perfect example. My, my grandparent, my nan. You know, my nan's gone through a series of experiences, you know, growing up, you know, during the Windrush era when they first came to the, the UK. Um, and when I have conversations about my nan, she's very one-sided because she reads the newspapers that maybe 20 or 30 pence at the local corner shop. 
So her understanding of the world today is based on the kind of the newspaper articles that she reads. Now she doesn't buy the Guardian, you know, she doesn't buy the, the you know, the independent that's going to probably have more of a research um, and more, I know, and I'm not saying every paper is accurate, but it, they rely on a lot of researchers, you know, for a lot, some, a lot of their stories compared to something like the sun or, you know, a local newspaper that's going to have just highly romanticized stories about particular issues within our society. And if I just look at my nan as, a, as an example, you know, I kind of look at that when you look at kind of in the society, you're always going to have individuals that are like that. They're going to watch things and see for what it is. And they're not going to question, they're not going to challenge. Whereas you may have people then like us that are more critical and say, okay, well, hold on there. What I've just watched in the news, that doesn't add up there. That doesn't make any sense at all. Yeah, I can stay in, I'm not allowed to congregate in my house in six, but I can go to the local bar and meet 20 people. Or it, grouse shooting. You, know, you it, can it go does, grouse shooting. doesn't add up. So we would do that, <laughs> whereas you're going to have some people that won't question it. Hmm. So with the conversation that we're having based on your question, you've also got a category of individuals that don't want to. So it's not just ignorant people. You've also got people that don't want to. And as I said, again, we're talking about systems that have been created to be intact. And I think that's the point. You know, when people say things like the system is broken, I don't have that perspective. I say the system is not broken. The system was designed to ensure that individuals benefit from that system. It only looks like it's broken from where I'm standing. But to the individuals in those positions of power, and like when you said Donald Trump and you give the example of all of those women, that's what power is. Yeah. The power dynamic is that you can say whatever you want. If I'm saying it didn't happen, it didn't happen. And that's how it functions. And that mentality only protects individuals that are within that realm. That wouldn't protect me and you. We're going jail. We're going jail literally just like that. You know, and, and you kind of see the kind of dynamic that happens in those spaces. You know, you see all of these big scandals around taxes and fraud. Make a single mother in our local community sign a signature incorrect at a nursery or to say something um, on a document. See how quick they get told that they have to pay back every single penny that they've taken from the government. So you see that complete different, um, what I would kind of say classist system that is kind of ultimately designed to, to adversely impact the lives of, of groups of people as a whole. So whilst that ultimately happens, you're going to have those groups of people that are ignorant, that's interesting, they'll start turning on each other because they didn't think we're the problem. So now my issue is the Polish family across the road. Now the Polish issue, the Polish family across the road are the Muslims that live at the top of the street. Now we all have problems with each other based on the things that we're, um, we have the opportunity to, I guess, um, have um, links to based on our resources in the proximity that we ultimately are. And whilst that happens, the distraction from the bigger problem, which is the power system, whilst that continues, those in those positions of power will continue to do what they ultimately do, which is almost completely create that divide. And that's why when we talk about the notion of change, that's why it's so difficult because not everybody's on the same page. You know, you understand what I'm talking about when I say my white counterparts. We want them to pledge allegiance. We want to stand, stand, stand by side. But somebody else may hear that and think, huh? I don't, I don't like what you're saying here. That just sounds very, you know, you just seem like you're just blaming white people for the reality of what... And you have people that have these conversations. You've got protesters that are protesting against the protesters because they're saying that, you know what, stop talking about Black Lives Matter because all lives matter. And it's not about all lives matter, white lives matter also too. So even in that dynamic of talking about fighting against discrimination and oppression, historically to one group of people, yet you still have groups of people saying, yeah, but my life also matters too, as a deflection to deal with this, the, the issue at hand. So, and then you have you, then your Tommy Robinsons that rile people up. Again, these are just distractions. And whilst we have the, the energy focusing on the wrong people, we then forget about the individuals that are 
mis misabusing their power, that are abusing women, that are abusing children, that are abusing funds, that are abusing different people, whether that is in education, whether that's in health, whether that's in, in entertainment, whether that's in politics, whether that's in law, the implementation of law. And we look at all of these particular types of things and see how people behave in institutions. And we say, wait there, clearly everybody's not on the same hymn sheet. And that is the challenge within society. That is the challenge. How do we arrive at a place? But I also understand that it, it, people are not going to arrive at the same place. And I think that is a very um, idealistic idea to have in a system that is designed to benefit one group over another. And I think it's interesting that I remember somebody saying to me, oh, you know, you should listen to, uh, to uh, Martin Luther King. And he said, you know, he's brilliant speech about having a dream. And I said, well, you should, you should also listen to Martin Luther King's later speeches before he died, because his perspective changed about that dream. And it's not that we weren't talking about allegiance, but also recognizing that there's a system and the way in which the approach that was ultimately being used was ultimately putting um, people of color at more of a default than in a, um, a particular type of position. And I think it's only that for me really that I guess I'm more so passionate about is pledging allegiance and working with um, individuals that are ultimately prepared to risk their lives for that change, you know, because I would like to think that, you know, when the suffragette movement happened that, you know, you didn't have people that were sitting there saying, you know what, oh, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, I kind of like what you guys are doing. You had people that were either down or out. And I just think yeah. that the same attitude applies. But, you know, it's, it's, it's almost like, and I just kind of feel that when people are talking about whether it's young people and meeting their needs or dealing with groups of people in our society that are oppressed, it's almost like it's a disrespect to even mention that these people need help. It's almost like a disrespect that you're even going to highlight that there's a disadvantage. And I think that that mindset is is part of British culture, unfortunately. It's part of our society. So when we talk about young people, you know, we can go back to Victorian times and see how children were treated. And they had gangs then. You know, and coming from Birmingham, you know, the Aston Sluggers, the Peaky Blinders, we like to make loads of, you know, dramas and, you know, but they're talking about gangs that hurt people. But we talk about gangs in, in the contemporary context and they're all, you know, people that, you know, are, are scums of the earth. But we now got, you know, people lining up in Birmingham to get to, to wait for the next showing or lining up, you know, just to get an autograph from cast members that are playing criminals that were destroying their communities in Birmingham. So it's important that we kind of understand the context of history is, as my concluding point to what I've just been saying and just understanding and recognising that not everybody's going to be with those that want to see change and I'm, I'm comfortable with that i don't i don't lose sleep over the ideal and i don't waste any time with individuals that don't want to learn or don't or don't want to um see a different society and it's not for them but at least for our children craig pinkney it's been absolutely fantastic talking to you today thank you so much for coming on um, and sharing so much wisdom so freely. And I know that the listeners are going to love listening to you. Thank you. Oh, thank you.